Good morning, Good morning. commissioners. Good morning, My name Mayor. is Joshua Lucas. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I've been a lifelong resident of Texas. Um, I'm here with the Tarrant Justice Network. I'm the jail advocacy section leader. I'm also on staff at Broadway Baptist Church as the community ministry coordinator where I work with the homeless and our outreach. And I'm also um, a student at Bright Divinity. And I'm also a member of the Justice Committee Thank you. who helped author this letter that we've sent to the Department of Justice. Um, <coughs> We're here because we're not really happy with the conditions in the Tarrant County Jail, as is documented in this letter. Um, but I, I think um, I'd like just now to take a moment of silence to honor the 90 deaths that have occurred in our jails this year in Texas, as well as the 75,000 who are still in custody. Thank you. Um, for me as a Christian, I think it's important to remember that Jesus, um, his ministry was cut short because he was taken into custody by the Roman Empire and beaten within an inch of his life before he was killed. That same Jesus started his ministry by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim that liberty to the captives, that they will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. It's my understanding that 75% of the people in our custody in the jails across the state of Texas have not been to court and they're innocent <clears throat> until proven guilty. And so I think it's important to remember how, um, how to treat these people with dignity and respect that they deserve. A majority of them have mental illness um, and, and a lot of them won't have competency to face that trial for a long period of time. It's my understanding that there's a lot of backup in the system for these individuals to even receive the care that they need to be restored to competency. And that's not even really a solution. It's not a long-term solution for them. It's really just so that they can face a judge and a, and a trial. And um, I, think, I think there's a lot of things that are gonna be said today that we need to really um, consider as we move forward to finding best practices and solutions. And um, for me, it's, it's really concerning that our jail in Tarrant County has passed all of the tests that you guys have procured for them. And, and the condition is that we're, we're seeing more and more deaths. You know, we started out looking at ways to bring the vote to those who are incarcerated as a constitutional right. And we were met with the conditions being so poor that we, we decided that it was more important to focus on the deaths than it was to enfranchise this population who's been discarded and forgotten. Um, and this is a jail that passes y'all's, all of y'all's tests. And, 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 um, and so that's concerning. That's why we felt like we had to go to someone outside, someone who's independent to do a review. That's why we, we contacted the Department of Justice um, to do an independent review of our jail in Tarrant County. So, so my prayer today is that your eyes may be opened, that you can hear what we have to say, and um, that's all that I have, so. Thank you, sir. Um, commissioners, my name is Julie Griffin. I am a member of Broadway Baptist Church and support the justice efforts on behalf of incarcerated citizens at the Tarrant County Jail. My words are my own. I am here because each person, especially the most vulnerable, deserves dignity, care, attention, and love. You have the authority and obligation to promulgate minimum standards, inspection procedures, and enforcement policies for the custody, care, and treatment of inmates. If these standards exist, if they are applied in your inspections, and if they are enforced by you, how can we have the situation that we have Whole worlds fall through the gap between the standards and the reality. These posters show the Tarrant County Jail's failures to care for its incarcerated citizens. These stories come with a search, Tarrant County Jail, Texas Commission on Jail Standards. Some call these sensationalized media stories implying that they are not the truth. But right now, the media and the lawsuits and hearings such as these are the only accountability shining a light on what really happens inside our jail. 
If the standards for custody, care, and treatment were met, there would be no media stories, no beatings or failures of medical and mental health care, and the number of deaths at the Tarrant County Jail would not be what it is today. So what is the reality inside the Tarrant County Jail? Please listen to two testimonies from, from our jail. I have been having so much trouble being in here with medical and everything else. I've put in a kite so many times for the abscess in my mouth and the tooth that it's under. My shoulder has been hurting and I've asked to go to medical so many times, but they won't send me. MHMR is not giving me my right medication. I gave them a list of what I take and they gave me something totally different. Here's another one. Medical has not sent me out to complete an MRI due to severe numbness in my left leg. I have fallen and woken up on the floor of my cell multiple times. I continuously send medical kites and grievance forms in which I'm told they will investigate and respond within 60 days. I've also notified medical as well as pot officers and their superiors of my staff in which they say, oh, it's just an ache or they completely deny medical attention, please help. And just this came in today from friends. This gentleman has a hernia. They scheduled him to be seen in the matter, but they've canceled three of the appointments. He's filed grievances and sent kites to be seen, still have yet to do so. They're aware of the severity of his pain in the hernia. He's no longer able to use the bathroom and there's enormous amount of pressure and pain in his organs. He says, this uh, incarcerated citizen, it's beyond extreme and there's blood when I wipe. I want to go to ER. Protocol says if they can't reduce it, I go to ER. I can't hardly piss. It's sitting on my bladder or something is tangled up. It feels like I'm being kicked in the balls. I've sent emergency grievances and been patient, but I can't take the pain no more. It's scary, the pain like this in this area and the blood, and now they won't do anything, <laughs> but they say be patient. It hurts or I wouldn't say anything about it. It's bracing, I'd never been this bad. So you see, we really want you to hear our plea. <laughs> Those in charge of our jail will not even say a problem exists. Commissioners, I know you do not want to be known as purely a paper pushing place. Please address the custody, <laughs> care, and treatment of the citizens and loved ones incarcerated at the Tarrant County Jail. We urge you, please, make unannounced inspections of the Tarrant County Jail both night and day. Please, it's the right thing to do. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Um, my name is Sophia Lewis. Um, I am here um, in regards to my deceased mentally Ill, Ill son that died in uh, Dallas County. September, um, his, they pronounced him dead on September 29th, but he had been in a Parkland hospital since September 23rd of 2022, but I did not get notified until September 26th, 2022, the call that shattered my life. My son, 24-year-old Shaman Tatis Lewis was mentally ill, <laughs> and it was documented with the courts that he was mentally ill. He had a history of being arrested, but they were able to, you know, mentally, mentally stabilize him and release him. But unfortunately, on this day, which he had a psychotic episode, which was my mother, his late uh, great-grandmother uh, birthday, he was taking it kind of hard, so she had passed in 2021. So he had a psychotic episode. He was, um, his behavior was aggressive. So they decided to arrest him when I was there on the scene with my 24 year old son to let him know that he has a history of mental illness and he needs to be stabilized before he goes to jail. Because of his aggressive behavior, the individual wanted him to be arrested because it was explained that he was gonna be just stabilized and released. They decided to take him to jail. Um, which caused the demise of my son. The barbaric behavior that my son experienced, no one, regardless of their demographics or socioeconomic status, should experience. He is no longer here to speak, but he will not be silenced, or anyone with mentally illness should not receive that type of barbaric treatment. I have to face the fact that I struggle every day my nerves have the best of me, but by the grace of God, I'm here, and I'm gonna continue to be here to fight, and he will not be ignored. He was loved, he was not thrown away. And y'all remember the name Sophia Lewis and Shaman Tatis Lewis. I have to accept the fact that Dallas County have never gave me an apolo apology. We're sorry that this happened or anything like that, you know, they're covered under this qualified immunity that I don't know who they are, but they know who I am. 
and his autopsy undetermined. Okay, it's undetermined, but my son arrived unconscious and he never regained conscious. And I have the pictures of the lacerations and the contusion all over his body, even on his private area that I have to deal with every day. I have to explain to a 16 and 18 year old, which is his sisters, what happened to him. The pain and suffering that has been bestowed upon my family, you can never, I would never wish this on my worst enemy. I have a 16 year old who can't concentrate in school because she keeps seeing her brother in the casket. I thought they was there to protect and serve, but no. They're literally, some of them are sheep in wolf clothing and something needs to be done. Mental health illness is on the rise. And this needs to be taken very seriously for mental illness people that's going into Dallas County care that's not stabilized. And I'm here to voice that. And something really needs to be done. They struggled with my son because he didn't want to dress out. They struggled with him for 12 minutes. You're asking a mentally incompetent 24-year-old to get undressed. He's not mentally stabilized, so he's had psychosis and paranoia. But you struck with him 20 minutes and he arrived unconscious. It's so many thoughts that go through my head, what I could have done, what they could have did better to pre prevent this. But no, my son is dead at 24. How would you feel if it was your son, your grandson, your nephew, your cousins? He was loved and he was not thrown away regardless of his past and what he was going through mentally. And I'm here to voice that for him. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning to each and one of you. Um, first of all, my name is Reverend Vernon, Vernon Ozan. I'm from St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, where Pastor James E. Nash is my pastor. I'm standing here because of Evan Lee. Evan Lee got killed in the jail cell. But what I'm saying is, is to this. In the book of Philemon, it talks about a slave and a, and a man that was over him. Now, Father Philemon, he was over he was over Onesimus. Onesimus was the slave. Onesimus turned around, he ran away. <clears throat> but he met up with Paul. When he met up with Paul, Paul talked to him about Christ. And the way Paul talked to him was to get his attention. I can imagine that Onesimus might have been mentally ill too. Because why? He did some stuff that didn't make sense to cause him to be in jail. And when you think about what's really going on in life, and when you think about how things are happening now, because now this is, mental illness is here, and it ain't going away. And we have to really pay attention to how we're handling the people. And the reason why I'm saying this is because so many people are getting hurt behind it. Family members are getting hurt behind it. Not only that, jail guards are getting hurt behind it. It's a whole lot of people getting hurt. But my thing is, is I'm just trying to get, bring your awareness to it, is that first we do have to take another precaution because it's called pre-precaution. In other words, we have to go get them people that's mentally messed up, uh, that's, that's been doing all kinds of things and causing themselves to be locked up. God wanted them in a place so they could be secluded so he could deal with them. But when we don't have nobody to help keep them safe, then it makes a bad situation. And then that's why things are happening so much. And what I wanted to say is, we have to help them to help themselves, but not because we want to help them to go destroy somebody else again. It's about helping them so they can understand that Christ wants them. That's the reason why we all live, because Christ wants us. He gives us another opportunity to do what we're supposed to do for him. And, and if we don't do it, then you know what the consequences are. Because why? It's about self-control. We have to get them in a place where they're under self-control, where they can think about Christ. Because Christ is the only one gonna help them out of this situation. Nobody else is. But how we're to handle them is the thing that causes problems. When we don't handle them right and something happens to them, you know that blood sheds on your hand. You know what God said. If you believe in him, and you turn around and allow something to happen to a brother, that blood is on your hands. So think about how many times that we've laid out, even God, 
even whoever else that was in control, the warden or whoever else. Think about how many people we didn't let get 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 lost in that in that situation. And we have to think about this. Every millisecond, God watches us, right? And I just want to say that, and I'm just going to be through with it because the simple reason. I just came to make sure that that bill for Ebony, make sure y'all pass it. And the reason why I'm saying to make sure you pass it is because that bill going to help put things in perspective and it'll get a start of something. And then when you do that, then you can see the other things that God is going to do with us. And that's the whole thing about it because we want to put Christ in the head. See, everybody leave Christ out. When you leave Christ out, damage happens. But when you put Christ in, blessings come. And that's what I want to leave with. Thank you, sir. Good morning, morning. Chairman Stout, commissioners, and Director Wood. Uh, Before I start, when you hold your fingers up, is that how many minutes I've used or how many I got left? I'll hold up two if you if you need me to do that. If two minutes. That means I've yeah. used two. Yes, ma'am. Got two. You, you okay. used two, and we got one <laughs> minute left. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am Air Force Major Retired Sharon Hines, and I've been trained since my twenties to speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. My affiliation with the Justice Network of Tarrant County has been an eye opener for me, because I was also diagnosed with sickle cell anemia in my twenties. When it came to my attention that Robert Miller's death while in custody at Tarrant County Jail was listed as sickle cell crisis, without him even having sickle cell, and it was later changed to undetermined. <coughs> but death by sickle cell crisis is comparable to having coronavirus without having COVID-19. It's like having, being an HIV carrier, but not having AIDS. Was anyone aware that the individual had asthma and was repeatedly maced without meds? So I became curious, and now I stand at 69 with sickle cell anemia, and it made, me uncom- made this uncomfortable trip to Fort, from Fort Worth because it's important that the Tarrant County Jail be held accountable for the standards set for jails. Since 2017, at least 52 individuals have died in jail, and countless others have suffered serious injury and illness. With further research, I found that from January 22 to June 23, there's a recorded 16 custodial deaths in 17 months in Tarrant County. January 3rd, 22, Alvy Johnson. February 19, James Carroll New. February 25, Edward Everest. June 17, O Young Park, June 28th, Thomas Simpkins, June 20th, July 20th, Traylon Warmly, August 27th, Richard Martyr, September 14th, Lionel Mitchell, September 29th, Kenneth Ray Perry, November 8th, Kevin LeBon, LeVon Brown, November 16th, Antonio Starr DeLuca, February 15th, 2023, George William Zink, March 20th, Heidemann Renee Gitz. March 23, Jason LeVar Jackson. June 24th, Adrian Chavez. And June 22nd, Joanne Lemons. So this year alone, that has, that's six, five deaths in six months. And these are all individuals with the presumption of innocence because they have not been to trial. So are we criminalizing poverty in Tar- Tarrant County Jail? And do we really want the message to be, if you can't afford bail, you may end up dead in the county, Tarrant County Jail? Is this the standard? Is this okay? Is it normal? Is it not suspect? And does it not warrant a no-notice inspection day and night? It's not only necessary, Commission, it's just the right thing to do in this situation. And I sincerely thank you for this opportunity to speak for those who could not speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Arise Hayes, and I am a program specialist at Disability Rights Texas. Thank you. Just want to point out, I'm a social worker, not an attorney. 
Disability Rights Texas is the protection and advocacy system designated to protect, promote, and advance the rights of individuals with disabilities. And while this is the first time that I've spoken before this distinguished board, uh, I wanna make sure that everyone knows that Disability Rights Texas <coughs> is aware and share concerns about individuals with disabilities languishing in county jails. I wanted to share actions that Disability Rights Texas has taken, along with other disability advocacy organizations, in our attempts to address the concerns specific to this population and to work to build a relationship between these advocacy organizations and yourself. I expect that all of you are aware of the class action lawsuit that Disability Rights Texas has filed, the Ward versus Young uh, lawsuit was filed in July of 2016 and is ongoing. The plaintiffs are defendants in criminal cases found incompetent to stand trial in order to be committed to a mental health facility for examination and treatment toward attaining competency to stand trial, but instead are languishing in county jails. A bench trial is scheduled for April of next year. I want you to know that this session, the Texas Coalition of Healthy Minds, of which Disability Rights Texas is a member, successfully advocated for the continuation of Rider, it's now Rider 35, which allocates $500,000 to continue psychiatric medication for individuals returning to jails from state hospitals determined incompetent to stand trial. The administration of the funds has returned to Tacomi, and the language has been broadened to include lab work and blood draws. We want to make sure that all of you are aware of this writer and use it to demonstrate the need so that we can be in a position to request an increase in funding in the future. There are additional recommendations that we have, a, have developed um, that do not require legislative action. We want to increase collaboration between the state agencies, the jails, and the local mental health authorities. HHSC has been asked to include medication history for the individual in the discharge packet that is received by the jails and to proactively address disposition of personal possessions for individuals being returned to jails from state hospitals. We have requested that the Health and Human Services Commission, Commission on Jail Standards, Tacomi, and the Texas Council for MHMR Centers meet to clarify the expected response when the LMHA receives a crisis call from the jail. We are open to hearing from other members about this issue, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here. I have gotten the perspective of other entities, but I have not had the opportunity to hear so much from individual sheriffs or jails. On a completely different topic, Disability Rights Texas is aware that the criminal justice system has moved to a digital system where inmate jail is scanned and the scanned document is sent to the inmate in an attempt to reduce contraband received through the jail. Um, Texas Administrative Code 291.22 privileged correspondence states correspondence addressed to or received from the list shall be considered privileged uh, correspondence. That includes the inmates attorneys. Disability Rights Texas provides legal representation to inmates and therefore mailed to and from disability rights should be considered privileged and exempt from being scanned. We also request that there be consideration of adding uh, the protection and advocacy system to the list in this section to make this more clear. And if there are any questions or concerns, I've provided you with my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. We are very concerned about the overcrowding in the jails. We know where this is coming from and we are doing what we can to try and get the state agencies to collaborate to address this and to make sure that individuals in the jails receive the assistance that they need to provide adequate care and treatment to those individuals. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. No, ma'am, we're just here to listen. I'm sorry? We're just here to listen. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you. <clears throat> Greetings. I'm Reverend Jocelyn Griffin Lee. To you, Chair, and everyone on this committee, can we pause just one second for those that have lost their lives, incarcerated? Thank you. I am associate minister from Brentwood Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. I'm the next of kin 
to my son, Evan, who was 31 years old at the time of his death. He was a high school grad. He was a college grad. He was an employee. Also, he had disabilities, mental health. He was a member of 29 custodial deaths in Harris County Jail, Houston, Texas, in 2022. As of today, 500 days later, our family still don't know what happened to my son. After getting a call from the hospital that Evan needed emergency surgery, not Harris County Sheriff's Office, but the hospital. Harris County Sheriff's Office, as of today, still have not reached out to our family at all. After seeing my son shackled to the bed in a coma, I thought, Lord have mercy. He was in there for an error in the system that he had written to the judge asking, please clear this error so I can get out of here and get to my family. That record is still on file, that letter that he wrote. Evan did not deserve the death penalty while waiting his day in court. No transparency at all from the Harris County Jail. The Harris County Jail has been citated on city, state, and federal levels. What is your plan to make them accountable? The deaths are on the rise in 2023. 10. What is your plan to make these facilities or hold them accountable for even proper training? I don't want this to land at your address. Please help us with the standards of life. Each human in the facility represents a community. If they fall, the whole community fall. My son, Dev, has sent me jobless, Homelessness, no car, health issues to helplessness. The facilities are responsible for human lives, not animals. Maybe if we could take immediate action to have an outside facility to take over. More funding would help to hire proper trained staff there. Where is the cameras? I'm hoping that the guards are able to see at least some of the things. Some of the time, I feel like all the time. I'm told my son Def is not on camera or his actions, whatever happened to him. But it's my understanding that there are good working cameras there. I'm sure the state is not going to put anything there that is not operable. Please, if you could make sure the super violent offenders, murderers, rapists, violent offenders, mental illnesses, they are separated from the general population. My family and I would like for whomever responsible for Evan murder to be charged with murder. If it happened on the streets, someone would be charged with murder or manslaughter. If it was a police or a citizen. Lastly, let the impossible be possible. Shut it down to get it under control. Why? No one deserves the death sentence while waiting their day in court. John 5.22, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judges to the son. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Tracy Smith, the mother of Kevin Smith that lost his life January the 31st in Harris County. It seemed like it just happened, but I have not yet received a call from Harris County stating what went on. He had a court-appointed lawyer. The court-appointed lawyer, I hired a lawyer for my son. They never had his lawyer that I hired from the free world. I had to call a lawyer and ask him, could he call to check on my son because I'm getting all kind of calls and inboxes on Facebook saying, check on my son, look like he's dead. I called, I spoke to one of the officers, they put me on hold, then they came back to the phone, oh, he was transferred to TDC. I say, how? He's still awaiting to go to court. After I said that, the officer put me back on hold, came back to the phone, oh, I can't speak with you because you're not his next of kin. I say, I'm, I am his next of kin, I'm his mother. I said, the only next of kin other than me is his daughter, and she's two years old, so she can't make decisions for him. I still have not yet, as of today, had anyone call me to tell me what was the cause of death of my son. First, when I called, they said it was an asthma attack. I said, Kevin don't have asthma. Kevin is perfectly healthy. Then, when I got the autopsy, um, I had to keep calling and calling. They say, oh, we waiting on Harris County to send us their records. But if y'all did the autopsy, what Harris County got to do with their records on what they filed for him? So finally, when I got the autopsy, now they say he had a heart attack. I said, 23 years old, anything is possible, but a 23-year-old is abnormal having a heart attack. After I called and called, tried to figure out anything, I say, well, where's the camera footage? Oh, it wasn't no camera where he was. I say, yeah, it was cameras, because when he went in there, I talked to him every day, all day. Even when I'm at work, I would tell my supervisor, I have to take this call. He went in there, he had a toothache. He said, Mama, can you please call up here? I need something for pain. I said, well, Kevin, I can see what I can do. Call, oh, we'll send him. Um, December the 12th, they sent him to Gauls Derby, Derby Unit. He said, ooh, Mama, I hate to say this. I understand I'm incarcerated, but it's better than me being downtown in Harris County. I said, what do you mean? He say, Mama, it's clean in here. They feed you. We able to talk on the phone. Everybody see they self. You get your personal hygiene here. He said, the county, Mama, they kept taking all my stuff. And it's not even just inmates. It's guards. And I feel if y'all came and picked him up to lock him up for a crime that he wasn't com committed to, convicted of, still innocent, you don't know if he was guilty or not guilty because he never made it to court. The day before I talked to Kevin, we got off the phone. January the 30th at 9.45. January the 31st, I'm not understanding how he's dead. Five, six hours later, when you go in there and you do count at maybe 3, 4.30 in the morning for the shift to change, he's still in his bunk, so I'm not aware. No one called his spin number to say, hey, Smith, the number to see if you attended, still nothing. And every time I'm calling, asking what's going on, I have no one to contact. No one has contacted me to say anything. So it's just, he was just a number, the fourth inmate. The third inmate before that, I don't have a picture of, but was my brother-in-law, Gary Wayne Smith. They denied medical attention for him. Still no call. The, the only thing we knew, the Texas Rangers is over. When we went to do the view the body, wasn't a body in the casket. Harry up and did a uh, cremation. So we don't know if them his ashes or not. And it's sad because my mother-in-law can't fight for us. She's 85 years old, so she can't deal with it. I'm trying to help her with my brother-in-law and all along help with my son to find out what really happened. I have to explain to his two-year-old daughter every time she comes to the house, oh, where's my daddy? I want to talk to my daddy. All she knows is to talk to her daddy on a tablet because at the other unit, he was able to call on a tablet. So when your phone ring, like the video call, and she think it's him calling. All, only thing I'm left to say is, oh, baby, it'll get better. He'll call one day. Because she don't know nothing now at two. But it's so hard. I've had back surgery, barely can go to work, because I'm missing out on stress, 
I've never had to take counseling or therapy, but now I don't even know how to cope. Kevin was my baby, my youngest child. I only have two daughters left. Ever since Kevin left, it's like the family, nobody can deal or cope. They tell me, get out the house, all I do is sit and cry. Meeting Miss Griffin, the one that just talked, she's giving me kind of leeway to even talk because she feel the pain I feel. If you never been through it, you don't know how it feel. I done lost mothers, grandmothers, uncles, all that. But when you lose your child, it's a different pain. It's like, I don't want to go on, but I have to go on in order to get justice to find out what went on with my son. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Doreen Geiger and a resident of Tarrant County. Our jail needs your help. Please help improve our jail and reduce the number of deaths and beatings. Since 2017, at least 54 inmates have died. This number is especially tragic because many of these deaths and beatings were preventable and caused directly by jailers. The Texas A&M Law School in Fort Worth has filed a request to the Department of Justice for a full jail investigation. I have given you each a copy of the DOJ filing and recent press articles that appeared after the filing happened. Examples are a nonverbal, mentally ill woman gave birth in her cell. The baby died 10 days later. No jailer checked on this woman or even knew that she had given birth. A homeless, mentally ill man with a history of asthma. During booking, while handcuffed and in leg restraints, he was pepper sprayed three times at close range. His complaints about being unable to breathe went unheeded. He was taken to a cell and 38 minutes later was found unconscious and died the next day. The county tried to cover up the cause of death by saying the man died of sickle cell disease, which he did not have. <coughs> A 28-year-old man who suffered serious mental illness and seizures. <coughs> Two days after booking, he was found dead in his cell, already exhibiting rigor mortis. The investigation revealed that staff had falsified records of routine checks for hours, pursuant to instructions from their supervisors. <coughs> One jailer reported that supervisors were only concerned about making the computer look good and that the sheriff was aware of these practices. Although the sheriff has told reporters that jailers do not beat up inmates, <clears throat> I know they're happening. This jail has failed to prevent harm, failed to comply with their duty to check on those in their care, and failed to comply with your commission standards. Of particular concern are reports by jailers that their supervisors instruct them to falsify records. I assume that you did not know that, but now all of you have been told you have the documentation from the DOJ request that provides proof. Please improve this jail. It is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, commissioners. Like Ms. Geiger, I also am part of a group who regularly monitor what goes on at the sheriff's jail in Tarrant County. Ma'am, could you identify and, yourself for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. That's My right. name is Jackie Cox. Thank you. And I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you a little now about a recent article, a series of articles that appeared on our KERA public NPR station and also got reprinted. They're by a, a really excellent reporter named Miranda Suarez. But the first thing that I want to talk about here is what happened to this inmate who was in the jail. 
He was in his cell. Three jailers entered the cell. One of them smashed his face into a concrete bunk that broke his face up very badly. These are these injuries were documented when he finally got taken to the hospital. Besides smashing his face, they also broke five of his ribs and deflated one of his lungs. He was left on the floor of his cell for 48 hours. They obviously didn't want to report what they had done, but it took 48 hours for somebody to find him and get him to the hospital. This past month, just a few days before the statute of limitations for having live pleadings on this passed, the district attorney who had had the, all, the three participants in the assault in the, in the jail, the perpetrators were all indicted. One was indicted for aggravated assault and the other two were indicted for official oppression just before the deadline for filing anything else and before anything could be refiled, these, ca these cases were dismissed by the district attorney's office. The question arose, were they dismissed for lack of evidence? The attorney for Mr. Rodriguez in the criminal trial saw the video. He said, the video clearly showed who the perpetrators were. You could easily identify them and you saw what they did. So, things are not going well in Tarrant County with respect to salvaging the rights of people who get beat up in our jail. Rather viciously, they get beat up. It sounded like a gangland sort of assault. So, I'm asking, please, send people down to investigate what's going on in Tarrant County. We need help. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Good morning, morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Director Wood. My name is Veronica Ordonez. My 30-year-old son, Ruben Delgado, has been mental health patient of the state since he was 23 years old. He never passed beyond freshman year of high school. He aged out. He had learned issues, but he was never assessed with IDD. He has been a arrested over and over again in Webb County Jail. He is currently in custody again. When he is received appropriate services 20 hours a week from Mental Health Authority, he does okay and stable. But then after stop monitoring him, which leads to him being arrest, arrest. I'm here today to tell you about several things have happened to him he, when he's in jail. The first time to go in 2016 prior to becoming mental ill, someone called us from the jail to say that he was sick. He was found that he lost 60 pounds in three months. We tried to see him, but we were never allowed. Captain Magana, he told us that he was not talking, not wanting to visit. But we finally managed to see him. He could not talk. The mental health authority got him out into the hospital where he was diagnosed with autism. He had never heard, I have never heard that word before, means going mute because of his trauma. Trauma so severe that he could not even remember what happened to him or what was done to him. This time he was arrested in May and he was assaulted by jailers on June the 22nd. When, he, when we saw him that day, his face was swollen, bruised. He had bumps on his head he had a broken rib. He couldn't even walk. We were told by some inmates that he was beaten by jailers. Morales, 
González Pais and Magane. He was beaten in the elevator and then taken to another room to beat him. They pulled his pants down, kicked his genitals. <laughs> and they laughed at him. Now he has a fractured lung struggling to breathe. Please help me, save my son. He is mentally challenged. He does not have the capacity advocate for himself. He's at all, he's not at all violent by nature. He's being bullied by his vulnerable. Please hold the count, Webb County Jail accountable for what they're doing to my son. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. morning. I'm Kyle French. I'm the whistleblower on the beating death of Jacoby Pillow. I was an inmate at the Harris County Jail. And you have a system in place in Harris County Jail to kill inmates. Our sheriff is a liar. And I'm asking for him to release the videos of Jacoby Pillow. Jacoby was said to have died at 1200 Baker Street, unresponsive in his cell that nobody knew what happened to him. I watched him flood the cell. I cleaned up the mess. He was then moved into what they call the Z cell, the only cell in the basement that does not have a camera. He's not the only one. I couldn't get names of everybody, but there is a system in place to beat and kill people. He was beaten so severely that he walked in under his own power and he was brought out of that cell on a stretcher. He was safely inside of that cell, beating on the door, telling me that I looked like a B word as I cleaned up the mess on the floor. He had plenty of strength. When he came out, his forehead was swollen out about two inches and his eyeballs were swollen shut. He was brought on a stretcher and put in front of the nurse panel, a line of nurses, seven nurses with Harris Health, sir, that saw this man and observed him like they do with drug overdose patients and people that are lethargic. They knew that the man was going to die. They said that they called an ambulance for him at 1120 at night. No ambulance ever came. We had Acadian for non-emergency and HFD when it was life-threatening. Nobody ever came. At 5.30 that morning, I'm sorry, 5.15, they loaded Mr. Pillow in a, in a wheelchair and they wheeled him to 1200 Baker Street where the news says he died and they don't know what happened. I saw it all. These jailers have since been moved to other positions and they still work for the Harris County Sheriff's Department. Close your eyes for a minute and imagine the things that I have seen. Heads being beaten against the walls. Men being pushed down the hallway with wheelchairs that don't have stirrups, that can't walk, their feet dragging and being ran over. Defibrillator machines that aren't being charged in the case of Kevin Smith. They didn't operate on him and give him mouth to mouth. They were, actually, they refused to give him mouth to mouth. They didn't have a pulmonary bag to blow on him. The defibrillator wasn't charged. The side rails on our stretcher were falling, off, falling down all the time. <coughs> and Mr. Gonzalez goes on TV and says, I don't know what happened. Release the videos. These folks need to know. There's not a single place in that, in that jail that does not have a video recorder. You got these thousand dollar Bosch cameras in every single corner of the jail. Thousand dollars, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a piece. They're not cheap and they all work. So to say that they don't know how he got out of what they called shitter number three, that's what the nurses, the staff, they call single holding cells shitters. That's what they think of these people. These people are awaiting trial, as these folks have said. They're not guilty. They haven't had a trial yet, but yet they're treated and drugged down the hallway like a piece of meat. People that are coming in for medical care, being beaten so badly that they're coming out paralyzed, and then I never see them again. I risked my life today to come here. The Harris County Sheriff's standing in the back. I know they don't like me. 
I risked my life to go on to Fox 26 and break the news about Jacoby Pillow. These folks need to know. We pay for these cameras. We pay your salaries. We pay the sheriff. And nothing's being done. Everybody just, everybody's got a broom cleaning it up. Jacoby Pillow was murdered by three officers. And they still work for the Harris County Sheriff. And Sheriff Ed Gonzalez knows about it. So does the folks at the FBI. I don't trust the Rangers. I'd like to trust you folks. But I'm here today because these people deserve answers. They came here with questions. I've seen what happens. People that are mentally ill or act out or sent to the clinic at nighttime down in the basement, and then they're just wheeled off and dumped somewhere so they can get lost in the numbers. Where does that armband say that you were? Where are those camera footage reels? I'll let somebody else have the mic. Thank, Thank you, sir. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Fanya DeWiron. I am here on behalf of my son, Zachary Zapata. I'm from Harris County Jail. Um, on June 5th, uh, Zach was arrested. Um, Zach suffers from anxiety, depression, and subsequently uh, substance abuse. He was transferred over to Harris County Jail on June 6th. Um, I spoke to Zach several days, um, several times over the next few days. On June 10th was the last day I spoke to him for quite some time. Um, on June 11th, we had not heard from him. A friend of his went to go visit was told that he was being transferred to another location. Um, at the time, he was in Baker Street, and we were told he was going over to San Jacinto. Um, several more days passed. She tried to visit him again, was told that he was hospitalized. So I started making phone calls, hundreds of phone calls, hundreds of emails, trying to find out what had happened to my child. At the end of the day, he is a 33-year-old man, but he is a very much loved son, grandson, brother, um, and we wanted answers. Um, later, I found out that he was returned from Bentob Hospital on June 14th and readmitted on June 16th. He was taken back to Harris County Jail um, but for those two days, and... Um, he continued to have some, some major issues, some life-threatening issues. So he was readmitted to the hospital on the 16th and then later released on the 19th back into Harris County Jail. To make a long story short, my son suffered a, an occipital skull fracture, a subdural hematoma, an epidural hematoma, a fractured spine. He had fecal incontinence, urine incontinence, and he was put in the infirmary at Harris County Jail, where he was slammed up against walls. I witnessed for the first time I finally got to see my son. I witnessed him falling on the ground and guards coming into the area to help him get back up. Um, his catheter bag was kicked around on the floor. He was drugged by his arms with a spinal fracture. Um, we worked with the courts to um, make some bail conditions to, to, you know, something that we could actually, you know, arrange. We were able to get Zachary out to make sure that he had proper medical care. While in Bentob, he was prepped for a craniectomy, which never happened. And funny thing is, he was returned back to Harris County the very next day. He was again prepped the second time for spine surgery, which again never happened, and was returned back to Harris County the next day. Once I got Zach out, um, he, he was literally pushed out the door, standing with no wheelchair, no crutches, holding a catheter bag. No follow-up visits, no nothing. My plea to you is you check into Harris County, you hear it over and over again, all the things that are going on. These people are human. They don't deserve this treatment. You know, we need to we need to do better for you know our fellow people. Um, and Dr. Porsa, I am a director at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. I, um, you know, we're taught do no harm to our patients. I don't understand how he was sent back to an infirmary the next day after being prepped for a craniectomy. I don't understand, and I've gotten no answers. 
Um, and Mr. Wood, to you, one of those emails or several of those emails were to you, were to you and I never see, received a response. I'm begging you all to take this very seriously and find out what is going on in Harris County Jail and put a stop to it, please. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I don't mean to interrupt. Can I, can I give you guys something real quick? Just want to give you this bottle. If you can place it right over there. Yeah, sure. It's shampoo. It's standard issue at the jail. It's a Proposition 65 cancer warning on the back. It causes skin burns. Just want y'all to... That was uh, something that went through your purchasing at the uh, jail. Somebody had to sign off on that. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Torres. I'm here on behalf of Michael Brandon Torres, my son. He is currently at the Hayes County Jail awaiting trial. Uh, due to the overpopulation <laughs> that the Hayes County Jail has, he was moved to the Maverick County. Three weeks ago, uh, he was on a fight. Due to that effect, you know, we'll, it's a jail. Guys get into the fights. He broke his, he broke his hand. He was denied medical treatment for three weeks until he was transferred back to the Hayes County Jail where they took him to the hospital put a cast on him and you know he's there um i'm i'm requesting i drove 12 hours just to have three minutes of your attention that's why i'm, I'm late um what's going on with maverick county my son is his case is in, in hayes county yet he gets moved over there gets mistreated i mean what's going on you know he's not he's he's innocent i mean he's he's not even he's still innocent you know he's not even going to trial yet you know, that's, that's unhumane, you know. Aside from that fact, you know, he was beat down by the guards at Maverick County, you know, put on a violent cell, you know, stripped naked, you know, that's for suicide watch. And I know that because I did eight years in TDCJ. So I know the living conditions that, that, that Texas TDC has, they're horrible. You know, here the, we were approaching summer, we're in summer, you know, Inmates are allowed to purchase one fan. If you have commissary money, but if you don't, you gotta wait on somebody to donate it or somebody to leave the jail to give you a fan. You know, we need air con, man. They need air cons up in there. You know, central air. And this is a matter that's been going on since the 80s, 90s. There's nothing new. You all know about this, you know. So, you know, but I just wanted to address that issue. But my son, um, you know, we, we are in current talks with an attorney. You know, but we would like for, for that address to, for that issue to be addressed with Maverick County as to why he was denied medical attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, y'all. I mean, Good morning. Just this. I always have to move these things down. My name is Nathan Fennell. I'm a lawyer at the Texas Fair Defense Project. Um, I wanted to provide, I have some copies of a press release from a lawsuit we filed about a month ago. Um, right here where we sued the Harris County Jail for uh, overdetention. All right, overdetention has become a term of art. Um, it is when you are legally free, but you are physically in jail, in custody. So this, this is for folks who were done with their sentence. These are folks who had done their time. They are in a jail and the jail did not release them for days or weeks or in some cases over a month after they had finished their entire sentence. So this is something that we think is very important, is very problematic. I would think that y'all and frankly, every freedom loving Texan would think that this is an important issue. Um, I can't get into too many of the details of it because there's ongoing litigation, but I wanted y'all to know that if anybody wants the actual complaint that we filed um, my contact information is there. I'm more than happy to send you the documents, save you a couple bucks on the, you know, from the clerk's office um, and follow up from there. But I appreciate your time. I, I really hope the commission will look into this issue, um, both in Smith County and wherever else y'all might find it in this state. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, good morning. My name is Lauren Johnson and I work at the ACLU of Texas. And I came to here today in a follow-up to an email that I sent to Mr. Wood a week or two ago pertaining to the phone book rule that y'all are <coughs> discussing doing away with. Um, and suddenly that feels very unimportant compared to the stories of death and harm that are happening to the members of the families that are in this room today. Um, but I promise you it's not. Um, 
I understand how reasonable it seems to want to do away with phone books um, because the world has done away with phone books. Um, and I realize that most people that are getting arrested probably do have cell phones, but not everybody. And the people that are coming in without a cell phone are probably at the highest risk for situations that we're hearing about today. So um, I would encourage you to consider some other options instead of just doing away with the rule. Um, we, some counties have kiosks. They can add attorney information just like they do with bondsmen and other resources uh, for the counties that aren't that tech resource heavy. They can create laminated sheets that have access to these attorneys. I think giving people an option to be able to reach out to uh, somebody that can potentially represent them might help us prevent some of the situations that y'all have heard about today. And one last note before I leave, I heard us um, take a moment to say prayer for law enforcement and other, other people um, and, and not discouraging that at all, but I would ask you to consider that um, we should be also praying for the people that are in our custody and care, because I promise you every single day in jails across this state, there are people circling up in jail and praying, and they're praying for you, and they're praying for the correctional officers, and they're praying for the police officers. So I would just ask that you give them that same consideration. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you for your dedication to maintaining state standards in our jails. I am Nan Terry, a current resident of Tarrant County. In recent years, I noticed the number of inmate deaths that seemed high. While some of these individual deaths have been investigated by the jail commission, I encourage you to examine the overall pattern of these deaths. It is important to note these inmates have not been sentenced to death, as others have said, and many are still awaiting trial. Some can't afford cash bail, some are mentally ill and waiting for treatment beds. It is crucial to look beyond the individual tragedies and ask ourselves, can we see a pattern of systemic negligence? Can we see a disregard for the standards established by this commission? The media and some of the fellow speakers have reported on multiple lawsuits filed by families, including Robert Miller, Havanti Myers, ZCH, a newborn, Georgia K. Baldwin and Dean Stewart. There may be additional lawsuits. Tarrant County has reached a settlement at least in at least one case. Several of these inmate deaths have resulted from a lack of necessary medication. For instance, on February 26, 2020, Ricky Farmer passed away after not receiving crucial medication to control his grand mal seizures. According to his family, Farmer had gone three days without this vital necessary medicine required to control his seizure. Um, the Department of Justice letter as mentioned by a couple of speakers that you have in front of you as, um, gives other examples of inmate deaths where Tarrant County Jail has not properly responded to incarcerated people's medical needs in a timely manner. I urge you to read that letter. On June 30th of this year, after two more deaths, the latest Star-Telegram editorial on this subject was entitled, How Many More People Must Die in Tarrant County Jail? before someone acts. Perhaps you will act. You may have heard Tarrant, or may will, hit, may will hear in the future, Tarrant Kearney has created one new position and is planning an expanded jail training facility. Although these, these steps may help, I can't imagine these steps alone will solve this crisis. The DOJ letter cites a quote from a federal judge's memorandum and order dated in March of this year, that the Tarrant County Jail status should, quote, put a reasonable policy maker on notice about potential condition of confinement issues at the jail. This is citation number 28 in the Department of Justice letter. Please, I urge you commissioners to make unannounced visits to Tarrant County, to the jail. It's just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for Tarrant County and for Texas. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Chairperson Strout. Sorry, Stout, Sorry. Commissioners and Director Wood. I'm here to speak on behalf of a loved one to shed light on the unacceptable conditions and minimum standards violations occurring in the Tarrant County Jail. A close relative who wishes to remain anonymous has had two encounters seven months apart in 2022 with the Tarrant County Sheriff's Department resulting in his incarceration in the Tarrant County Jail. He suffers from mental illness and can be disruptive when he's in a manic episode. 
On both occasions, he was in a manic state. On the first occasion, the charge was disorderly conduct, class C misdemeanor, and was dismissed. On the second occasion, the charge was harassment of a public servant and was eventually no billed with no indictment. On both occasions, he was taken to the Tarrant County Jail where he was savagely beaten when he declined a strip search. The second incarceration was the most traumatic. While there, he suffered from panic attacks, which were exacerbated by his already manic condition. The jailers beat him relentlessly, resulting in a broken rib. At one point, he was stripped naked and strapped to a chair. He was not allowed to relieve himself and forced to urinate and defecate while sitting in that chair. He was not allowed a phone call on either of these occasions. I'm sorry. When he failed to return home, we suspected he might have been arrested and called the jail to see if he was there. They refused to give us any information, claiming they were not allowed to. What our relative experienced was nothing less than torture. It calls to mind the horror stories we heard coming out of Guantanamo or the Soviet Gulag or the abuses routinely practiced by some third world dictatorship. Our experience with the Tarrant County Jail is by no means unique. Many have suffered worse over months and years in the Tarrant County Jail. These practices are pervasive. They are not exceptional, but by design. We condemn such practices when we hear about them in other countries. We should not tolerate them in our city or our <clears throat> country. Some of the things we want to see, better oversight of the Tarrant County Jail. I, I, I think that that's y'all's job, is oversight of the county jails. Um, and increased utilization of Tarrant County's Mental Health Jail Diversion Center. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jennifer LeBeau. I'm a resident of Tarrant County, a lifelong Texan, and my family spent uh, over 20 years in the Foreign Service uh, traveling the world, living in places like Honduras, uh, Cuba, Mexico, and Senegal. I want to talk today about um, a phrase that, that I'm old enough to remember almost every Baptist church having, um, a be ye kind one to another class, by Coda class. The rest of that verse goes on to say, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, loving one another. I think it's really important to note that while we have a lot of heartfelt sympathy and thanks for the family members who have come today, um, there are a number of citizens here who are concerned with the um, state of the jails who don't have any personal tie to the jails. Um, it is a responsibility and a duty for us to care for one another as citizens. And um, the, the person who spoke before me rightly noted that there are similar reports of human rights violations committed in some of the countries where I lived. And we as an American government condemned those human rights violations. And then to come home and see those same kinds of things happening in my very own county is disheartening, it's disappointing, but also it makes me feel like we're not um, doing a good job of being an example to the world. We always talk about how Americans have civil rights, have human rights, and it's important that we follow through with that responsibility and duty to each other. I, I urge you to please come visit the Tarrant County jails and see the conditions that our citizens are living in when they're arrested. And as it's been noted many times today, these are not people who have been convicted. And many of them face medical issues as well as um, mental health issues. So please come and, and help us um, represent our county and our country in a better manner. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hi. My name is LaVon Cockrell and I live in Fort Worth and I taught gang members in high school. And I haven't been more intimidated than I am right now. 
and I respect what's going on here, and but I falter, if I falter in what I'm going to read, is because I am very nervous. I don't know if it's because there aren't enough women on the board, on the commission, or what it is. Maybe it's the testimony, but inside I am shivering. I'd like to read this letter from my renter, who is now my friend, and she'd be here herself, but her mother is elderly and she had plane tickets she couldn't cancel. So she begins with, July 30th, 2022, to whom it may concern. While I am by no means proud of this fact, I have been in and out of the Tarrant County Jail since 2001 through 2020 for driving while intoxicated. I have absolutely no excuse and was completely selfish by putting others' lives at risk while devastating my family and friends. The root cause of alcoholism is selfishness and self-centeredness, and until an alcoholic recognizes that, they won't change, but rehabilitation can help. I had taken prescribed Xanax, and, and four hours later, I was stopped in Denton. I was completely sober, I was never indicted, but was sentenced to Tarrant County Jail because of the arrest in Denton. This was 10 days after completing five years of probation, paying fines, completing community service, appearing to required reporting, passing drug tests, and successful work release. For 20 years, I had been, on, I had been prescribed Xanax and five years of Suboxone. I had just gotten out of rehab and was switching to non-narcotics in an effort to subside withdrawals, depression, and anxiety. My father had just passed away. I couldn't be with my family. I was hopeless. When I turned myself into Tarrant County, I had medication MHMR had prescribed, but was told I couldn't take it. I withdrew off that medication while still dealing with opioid and Xanax withdrawals. It took MHMR 20 days to prescribe medication and because I was transferred to TDC that same night, I never took the medication. I truly think the state and county should consider using the drug Subutex, which dissolves under the tongue, helping opioid addicts avoid death or violent withdrawals. I've watched so many women have serious seizures, fall off bunks and chairs onto concrete floors, refuse to eat or bathe, there are so many people in that jail who make my mental illness look like a minor headache. Jail isn't helping them. Most of them don't even know why they're there. The mentally ill need to be identified in county jail so they receive proper treatment before they end up in TDC. Is that the end? Do you mind if I finish? Go ahead. Um, the mentally ill need to be identified in jail so they receive proper treatment before they end up in TDC where they'll never get the help they need. I saw it firsthand and it's really sad and inhumane. There are girls hiding their pills and selling them for commissary, which could very well lead to overdoses. There are medical emergencies constantly and the lack of urgency exhibited by the officers is appalling. It hasn't always been like this either. The officers used to care, but that's rare to come by now. This is the last. Lastly, while in Tarrant County Jail, guards refused to give toilet paper, sanitary items, soap, and cleaning solutions. Indigent inmates couldn't afford these items. And in a room with 60 women, those resources were needed. Inmates may be good people. They made bad, may made bad mistakes or they may be terrible people. Believe me, I've met plenty of both, but something needs to be done to better distinguish between the two, to identify and assist mentally ill inmates, to assist drug addicts with tools to help them turn their lives around, and to make sure the bad ones stay where they belong. I graduated from Texas Christian University with a business degree and worked in commercial banking for 15 years. And I'm extremely grateful for the support I received from my family, friends, attorneys, counselors, treatment facilities, employers, and AA for my sobriety. But I can't give any credit to Tarrant County. I hope you'll take this into consideration when determining ways to prevent deaths and poor treatment at the Tarrant County Jail. Thank you, Emily. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Burnham. I served in the Texas legislature for 18 years from Fort Worth. And uh, you may have heard, noticed a number of people are here today from Tarrant County. Uh, my 
relationship to these concerns goes back to the 70s when the, the Ruiz case was filed against the state of Texas for its utter failure in serving the people of Texas and running the state prison system as if it were a pre antebellum era plantation system. Things have not improved that much in the Tarrant County Jail since the Reese lawsuit against the state. There have been lawsuits filed against the county jail, but things simply have not improved. You've heard the presentations today. I started going to the commissioner's court for the first time in years last fall, and I told um, the commission members then, I'm only gonna come and bother you when then there's been another unnecessary death in our jail. I uh, attended three commission court meetings last fall. Each time I asked on behalf of my faith community, the Religious Society of Friends, for the opportunity to tour the jail. And it was not until the third time where I publicly asked that the sheriff finally managed to get me in touch with the right staff people to set that tour up. And eight of us took a tour right before Christmas, making it a very meaningful Christmas for me. I want you to know that one of the things that stood out to the eight of us that had that tour were the cries from the women about being denied their meds. You just heard one of the letters talking about the way the women are treated in the state jail. Now, I know that you guys have not had the opportunity to read this 34-page, 142-footnote document that has been submitted to the Department of Justice. But more concerning to me is a public admission by the sheriff on uh, the third week of July that he'd not bothered to read it and had been publicly available since May. He apparently does not want to know the facts of the matter. So I know because I sat through the appropriations process this session as a volunteer and representative John Bryant's office, that you're totally inadequately funded. But you all were appointed by the governor and you all should be asking for more money so you can get your job done. You're simply not getting your job done. And I will end with saying this. Some system changes are really difficult to achieve, but a system change that would allow people not to wait seven people deep at a time could be as simple as calling out three names and letting them come up and, and stand ready to speak. So it saves your time. There are a lot of simple systemic changes that need to be made and you are in a position to make them. Please do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Karthik Sura and I'm a former teacher from Harris County. And I'm here because I went to a, a uh, I don't have any personal relationships to anyone in the Harris County Jail or the Tarrant County Jail, but I, I was at a, a criminal justice protest and I, I met Jocelyn Griffin and learned about the story of her son, Evan Lee, and what happened to him. And it was it was appalling to me to, to, to hear the story and realize that after 500 days, like in, in what we always call the greatest country in the world, the ninth largest economy in the world, that she hadn't gotten an autopsy report. She had no idea what happened to her son. She still hasn't received the autopsy report. We, we talk about how we were a great state, and we are, but like we have to reimagine the system of justice that people are facing, because right now it's very obvious that it's, it's an injustice system, right? We, we hear a lot of times in this building about how, uh, you know, we need to talk more about our, our heritage as a, uh, of the heritage of European Americans and the heritage of the West. So let's talk about that. These types of killings, these types of torture, this doesn't happen in, in Scandinavia. It doesn't happen in Denmark. It doesn't happen in Sweden, right? Like we, we have a criminal justice system where we're over incarcerating people. We're not giving justice to people that deserve it. And we're not giving mentally ill people the, 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 uh, the treatment that they deserve. And I think right now, like the cases, the fact that like we're, we're doing this this hearing in a room that's air conditioned, right? But there's a number of prisoners. I think it's 75 percent of prisoners right now that are incarcerated don't even have access to AC. Can you imagine how it would be in your suits, in your dresses right now, if this was in 85, 100 degree weather, right? We we need, <laughs> as the previous speaker was saying, really asking you all to reimagine what our system could be, because this is the ninth largest economy in the world. 
Like, is this the ninth best justice system in the world? Is this the ninth best criminal justice system in the world? Ninth best system of uh, jails that we could be having? It's it's very clear to, to everybody in this room that this is not working. It's not helpful for people. And it's, it's not a case where we can have both security as a zero sum game versus justice. We can have both. And that happens when we have a system that works. I would really love to call on all of y'all to, to really to, to reimagine what justice in Texas can be, because right now it's an unjust system. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm Sonia Burns. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm gonna talk more about what needs to be working so we're not dealing with the crisis of the persons with mental health needs going through the jails. So I did send some of you an email after the House Appropriations hearing uh, February 15th. If you did not watch it, I would recommend you go back and watch it. I can resend the email. I think, Mr. Wood, you have that email you could possibly share. I gave you the exact minutes where the heads of HHSC literally said the number of persons with IDD in the jails is not a great concern. So I would like to remind you all that you have an IDD advisory committee because in fact, it is a great concern. So one of the things that happened this session was SB 944. People don't know this, but we have 13 state supported living centers in Texas, and that serves persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I may go over and I am gonna ask that you just let me finish what I have to say, sorry you all, because you need to go back to your counties and say these things. Um, IQ of 69 or below diagnosis by 18. The health and safety code was such that anybody could file directly for a commitment, but it also required a report from the interdisciplinary team. The LIDAs, the local IDD authorities are always part of this team and they do not make referrals. I have been hearing from the state hospitals for years and years. I have a person, I have many people that need to go to a state supported living center, but somehow we don't wanna institutionalize people. We feel more comfortable with them sitting in cages, coming to the state hospital, cycling over and over and over. Right now, we have many people in your jails. I have one that has been cycling 20 years. Not once has he ever heard the mother, I just talked to her again the other day. Nobody Ever mentioned an SSLC to her. So now you can file the parent or guardian without that IDT. And just to like make an impression here in Travis County, Integral Care, our local IDD authority, local mental health authority made 10 referrals in five years. Even though they served over a thousand people who were fully eligible, I don't think everybody should go, but they shouldn't be sitting in jails and the state hospitals. When we have such a demand on our state hospitals, which is your public mental health system, which is the next point I wanna to make to you all. SB 26, omnibus bill from Senator Kolkhorst. HHSC at the very last second did something that should be of great concern to all of you in this room because state hospitals must comply with EMTALA. If you show up in an ER and you are bleeding out and I'm full, I still have to evaluate you. If you need admission and I don't have space, I have to transfer you. All state hospitals must comply with EMTALA. But HHSC got language in, in the health and safety code that said we don't have to take voluntary admissions. We already knew that, you don't have to take them. But most people, and I'm telling you at the highest levels, don't know what EMTALA is. There is no written MOU for a law officer that you cannot go and do your emergency detention to a state hospital. There is nothing written. In fact, our entire system is in violation of federal statute because we are being told we go through the LMHA's utilization management, UM, to find out where that bed is. If you are law enforcement and you continue to take the person over and over to the same hospital that kicks them out over and over, and then maybe they get arrested, that is not the nearest, most appropriate facility, which is what EMTALA says. So you may wanna go to the state hospital, but now we're gonna say we're not gonna do the voluntary. They should have at least required a reference to EMTALA and a reporting requirement because we need to have the data of how many people needed help. We flooded the wrong system. We filled the jails when we should have filled the state hospitals and the other facilities that needed to serve people appropriately. The right place, the right treatment, the right time. We'll keep hearing the catchphrase, it's not happening. 
we have to make sure that our state hospitals are accessible. It's a misnomer. When you need that level of care, it is really residential treatment. The Dallas area has gotten funding for a state hospital. I was in a high level meeting last week. They are saying that what they predict the average length of stay will be is two weeks. This should sound alarms for you all because it is not going to serve the purpose. You want a functional system of diversion, a respite center to get to. If you need a longer stay, then use those community hospital beds that we just gave millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to that kick you out by day 14 because of Medicaid and the payment rates. And then if you still need more time, then you get to the state hospital. And I'm gonna work on a cheat sheet for the county commissioners all across Texas to be able to look at their own counties and ask the right questions because legislators don't know what they don't know. And unfortunately, we're getting a lot of information from the highest level. And I am telling you what we have done this session, we have codified that we must criminalize mental illness for you to get treatment. All right, thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else would like to make a public comment? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Cindy Stormer from Tarrant County. I was the um, chief of the mental health division for the Dallas District Attorney's Office, where they were found to have the most effective mental health division anywhere by Texas A&M University. I'm also the author of Brainstormer, dealing logically, ethically, and efficiently with the mentally vulnerable and those with addictive tendencies, what's wrong with the criminal justice system and how to fix it. Are we afraid of them or are we just mad at them? If we're just mad at them, they shouldn't be incarcerated. Uh, Dallas County put a competency attorney in there and saved $300,000 that county the first year that that person was in that position. The taxpayers on average pay more than twice as much to keep the mentally ill in jail and they stay in jail four times longer on average. The budget director in Dallas County said that our use of those funds was a very good use of those funds. And the answer to the question of these problems that are presented, for the most part, is public defenders, mental health public defenders. These um, attorneys will solve a lot of problems. They make, make it safer for all of us. They'll make sure that the people that we're afraid of stay in jail and the people we're mad at get services. In Dallas, we would do comprehensive assessment treatment services as soon as someone came in the jail. We discovered that when we started implementing that, we had a 70% reduction in recidivism. And we were able to identify those with homicidal ideations. We might have stopped some mass shootings there. So safety is improved and it lowers the expense. You have to pay private attorneys anyway to represent people. You just go ahead and hire a public defender that is on the payroll. That's just money that you are just reallocating. It avoids lawsuits. There's been personal liability for people in official capacities in other states that had to pay huge fines and lose their jobs. Just having one person in a county that's responsible for the people that are incompetent will move those cases a lot faster, will reduce liability, save hundreds of thousands of dollars to, for the taxpayers, will reduce injuries to the staff, and they will get those low-level, non-violent offenders out of the jail where they shouldn't be anyway. And then the third aspect of that is it reduces crime and recidivism. If people will get together and brainstorm the, the, the players, the important players in your counties, your mental health professionals, your social workers, your sheriffs, your jails, they get together and they evaluate what resources are available. And then they make conditions of probation where the people will stay on their medicine, see their psychologist, get into housing, whatever else they need. In conclusion, um, I've been a police officer, I've been a defense attorney, I uh, was a career uh, prosecutor, and I uh, just kept seeing the same problems occurring over and over again. And when I was the elected district attorney in Cook County, in the first year we saw a 25% reduction in crime, 
and we cut the jail population in half just by moving those cases faster, by getting people out of the jail that shouldn't be in the jail in the first place. And then we can uh, focus our resources on these very serious cases that we've been hearing about today. If you have one attorney that's responsible for competency hearings, responsible for mental health, the other private attorneys know who to go to for that. They understand the complexities of the law on competency and insanity. If you had one public defender for every 33,000 population in your counties, this would alleviate a lot of the problems that you've heard here today. That's what we have in Dallas County. We have 80 public defenders. It's very effective. I'm from Tarrant County now. We have no public defenders. It's the largest county in the United States with no public defender's office. Also, you could mandate training by an experienced prosecutor <laughs> training for prosecutors, for judges, for law enforcement, for private attorneys, this, uh, to train to reduce the arrest and reduce over criminalization and create a mental health czar, a statewide position where someone would know where to come to with their complaints. They could educate jailers and sheriffs and commissioners and county judges, one person in charge of promulgating these rules and implementing science and evidence-based <coughs> procedures. And I could tell you a lot of examples that I've come across in my career that's not just people being um, in jail, innocent until they're proven guilty. In Dallas County specifically, when I was the chief of the mental health division, I found numerous cases where the mentally ill were factually innocent. People don't like them on their property. The, the number one charge they get charged with is criminal trespass. Neighbors don't like them. They lie to get them in jail, to get them out of the neighborhood. Caseworkers don't like them. They lie because they're having sexual relations with these mentally ill people. They're trying to cover it up. Social workers, some, some of them. Stepfathers don't like them in the house and they lie to get them arrested, get them out of the house for a while. So if we can just keep these nonviolent offenders out of the system, we'll be ahead of the game. And I have a synopsis of my talk just now. There's more in this, but. And thank you, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else for public comment at this time? Thank you. Having none and seeing none, we'll move on to Old business. A, hey, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't see you there. That's all right. Um, I'm sorry. I know public comment has gone on for about an hour and a half. I didn't want to take much time. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Krish Kundu. I'm the co-founder and director of Texas Jail Project. I just wanted to talk about a couple of stories that you're never going to hear in this room and you're never going to get them in your reports. But this was just a shock to me when I talked to this family yesterday. It really brought it home to me how bad things are in Harris County Jail. Um, young man named Michael, yes, a few weeks ago, he jumped out of an ambulance after being arrested by the, by the sheriff's deputies, and he died on the freeway because he had spent some time in the jail back in September, and things were so bad that he just did not want to go back to the jail. He had a long history of mental health issues and substance use disorders, and he had tried to get help. He was trying to get help. He was in a program. When he was rearrested by the sheriff's deputies, he hit his head in the car so hard that they had to get a call an ambulance. And when he got in the ambulance, he jumped out on the freeway. His wife called me yesterday and said, I have never lost anyone that I was in love with, and I don't know what to do with myself anymore. The world is just completely silent. Things were so bad in the jail that he decided it was better to kill himself on the outside than go back to that jail. And this is, this is not a death you're going to see on your custody death report or, or hear about it. Um, but the sheriff's office is responsible for it and the jail is responsible for it. I want to tell you one other story, because you keep hearing sheriffs saying, we don't want people with mental illness in the jails. But when we talk to people, I don't understand why they keep arresting people from group homes and hospitals. And you all might have heard this one. This happened in Smith County. Young man who was suicidal, extremely psychotic, was taken to the hospital. 
on the advice of the local mental health authority, <coughs> where he tried to kill himself, and then they called the sheriff's office, and the sheriff's office happily took him into the jail, despite the psychiatrist's orders not to discharge him because he had an outstanding warrant. He went to jail, sat in the jail for a week, and then ended up killing himself anyway in suicide watch. So when people keep saying we don't want these people in our jails, I don't see any effort by the sheriffs to not take them into their jails. They could have a policy in place not to take people in crisis, but they keep doing that. One last story from Harris County, which again, you're not gonna hear because she survived, thank goodness. Arrested from a group home because she called the police herself because she was hallucinating. They came. No one was hurt, nothing happened, but they arrested her, assault on a peace officer. She spent over 100 days in the jail on a $5,000 bond, <coughs> transported to the hospital, went on a ventilator, was going to die, but she did not. Thank God she did not, which is why you're not gonna hear about this. But again, why was she arrested from a group home and brought to the jail when it's already so overcrowded and they cannot provide the care that's needed. So when shadows keep telling me that we don't want these people in our jails, we need to see that action that you actually do not want to take them into your jails. Don't arrest them from hospitals. Don't arrest them from group homes. Don't arrest them from behavioral health hospitals where they went to get help and have a policy in place where you can turn people away when they are in severe crisis, because you cannot afford to take care of them in your jails. It's a liability and the taxpayers don't need to pay for that. And we certainly can't deal with the human trauma that falls out of it. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am.